Alleluia. It's a wonderful day to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. He is victorious over sin, death, and the enemy. Thanks be to God. And when our starting place is the resurrection of Jesus, it makes reading the Gospel of John come alive for us. We see how Jesus wants to multiply life in us and through us. As a people gathered here today, and as a people scattered throughout our city throughout the rest of the week. This morning, we're going to continue in the Gospel of John by reading John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Today's sermon title is Clearing the Way to Freedom. Now, as we read this passage this morning, I would encourage you to ask a question. How is Jesus bringing freedom in this situation we're about to read? So I'd invite you to please stand as we read the Gospel this morning. John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, He found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple Jesus had spoken of was His body. After He was raised from the dead, His disciples recalled what He had said. Then they believed the Scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while He was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs He was performing and believed in His name. But Jesus would not entrust Himself to them, for He knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for He knew what was in each person. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we pray You would speak to us through it today. Challenge us and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The scene that we find Jesus in this morning is one of chaos. Like Jesus, many others had gone up to Jerusalem in order to celebrate the Passover. There were many things that they needed in order to prepare for the Passover feast as well as to make proper sacrifices. It's kind of like when Fasica approaches here in Addis, and we find sellers in white tents at hundreds of intersections throughout the city, selling honey and baked goods and Berberet, leather bags, you name it, and they're selling it there. We also see sheep appear on every corner, it seems. It all suddenly appears as the season approaches. But in Jesus' day, the place where these items were being sold was in the outer court of the temple, the court of the Gentiles. The temple was divided into different courts, one for men, one for women, one for Gentiles. God, in His mercy, had set aside a place where those who were non-Jewish God-seekers could come to pray and to draw near. It had been blessed to be a place of shalom, a place of peace, where the non-Jewish person could seek God. But what did Jesus find there? A chaotic market. A place that was set aside originally for outsiders to seek God, now had a marketplace in the middle of it for insiders to get rich. 
New barriers have been put in place that benefited the merchants and the insiders, but that distracted those who were genuinely trying to worship God. So Jesus did the unbelievable. He drove out the animals. He turned over the tables. And He kicked out the merchants. Jesus, full of compassion, zealously cleared the way so that outsiders could clearly see the Father. Jesus cleared the way for outsiders to freely know God. And He calls us to follow Him into the same activity today. On this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ through His death and resurrection, may we consider the ways that we might offer barrier-free opportunities for others to meet Him too. We're going to look at four ideas in this passage this morning about Jesus clearing the way for freedom. We start in verses 13 to 14. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. The first idea for us to follow Jesus in clearing the way is to see the barriers. You know, I believe many of those merchants were not evil people. However, over time, they lost sensitivity to how God wanted to make Himself known to the nations. They brought the animals and the money exchange into the court out of convenience for the Jewish worshipers. Perhaps over time, they didn't even notice that they were creating an atmosphere where it would have been impossible for Gentiles to focus on worship. Imagine if next week, We decided to clear away a number of rows of chairs on each side. We created huge aisles over here and we invited a bunch of merchants from Mercado to come in and sell their wares on Sunday morning. We'd have merchants yelling in the middle of worship, come here, buy from me, I have the best price, I'll give you the best deal. It might create a distraction for us who are trying to worship God. There were other barriers in place for all the worshipers, especially for the poor. If you traveled, you did not bring an animal with you because of the great chance it might get sick or injured along the way. So instead, you bought a special temple animal that had a surcharge added to it. You paid more for a temple animal because someone was there to take advantage of your need in the moment. The best example I have of this is an American example. I apologize in advance. But my one daughter and I, Hannah, our favorite date in America is to go to this convenience store where we buy two hot dogs for 99 cents. Now, a hot dog is one of the most nutritious foods known to men and one of the tastiest as well. But we sit there and we enjoy those hot dogs, two for 99 cents. But this amazing phenomenon happens if I go down the road and I go to an American baseball game and I walk inside the ballpark, a similar hot dog inside the ballpark will cost me six U.S. dollars. The reason being, I am a captive audience inside the ballpark. I can't shop around. They have me where they want me in that moment, as did the merchants in the temple. This became especially hard for the poor. Their offerings were doves, and we see that Jesus specifically chased the dove sellers out of the temple. Chances are these guys were charging exorbitant prices, taking advantage of the poor's desire to worship. Taking advantage of the poor who want to worship God is shameful. Absolutely shameful. Then there were the money changers. Currencies needed to be changed into the temple money, the temple currency. They charged commissions on the exchange. 
thus creating an unfair advantage for the temple and for the money changers. Another barrier that would hold others back from worshiping God. The temple was full of distractions, barriers, corruption, and profiteering. So Jesus walked in and cleansed it, clearing away the barriers that stood in the way of God worship. I wonder what barriers we have today. What have we put in place that keeps outsiders from being able to worship the living God? Let me share a few and a potential solution. One is unintelligible worship. Words, songs, spiritual gifts that make others feel like they don't belong. That makes it so they cannot understand what is happening in the midst of worship. Materialism. A continual focus on success and the need for money and more money and more money. Corruption and pride. Leaders who do not serve, but rather use others to provide for their desires. As well as a lack of stewardship, the understanding that everything truly belongs to God. Legalism and rules. Rules that are not stated in the Bible, but that we will hold fast and strong to. And hypocrisy. Where we're one way here on Sunday morning, but then we live life totally different the other six and a half days of the week. These create barriers for an outsider. They obstruct the view of who Jesus is and what He came to do. They create convenience for some while making barriers for others. Well, what is a solution? I believe it is in changing our focus. We typically think of insiders versus outsiders. And what we do is, I don't know if you'll be able to see this up on the screen or not. It's Maybe you can, but I'll try to describe it to you. On your left, you'll see a circle with a really strong line around the outside. Inside of that circle are bees. We'll call them believers. The ends on the outside are for non-believers. We say the church exists though for those who are inside the circle. We then create all kinds of rules and traditions that make sure that we continue to be perceived as insiders while the outsiders are kept out. It is us versus them. We begin to fill the court of the Gentiles with barriers that protect us and our status while excluding anyone else from coming close. But there is another way. It's called centered set thinking. It's this second example here. If you look at the very center, you'll see a cross representing Jesus. Jesus is at the center. We no longer create barriers, but rather we start asking a question. That question is, who or what are people moving toward? It becomes an important question, not only for outsiders, but for insiders too. Are you headed toward Christ or away from Him? Are you following Him in this moment Or are you walking away in the other direction? It is the question that draws each of us into discipleship and calls us away from me-centered worship, materialism, pride, legalism, and hypocrisy. It is no longer about I am inside the church while building thicker walls against outsiders. Rather, the primary question is, Am I and are we following Jesus? If we are, then others will see Him in us and they will be attracted to Him. If not, then others will simply see distractions and barriers that will just look like lifeless religion. May we identify the barriers in us and rid ourselves of them. 
This week, I'd invite you to spend some time thinking about the barriers that others perhaps see in your life that keep them from being able to see Jesus clearly. The second idea is in verses 15 to 17, following Jesus in this way of freedom. So Jesus made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The second idea is to be zealous for God and his mission. When we see Jesus acting in this setting, it can leave us a bit surprised. We become used to seeing Jesus as meek and mild. Some of this comes from a theology in certain songs we sing. There's a hymn that's written by Charles Wesley, which is he is one of the greatest songwriters of all time, by the way. I love his hymns. However, he has one hymn that starts out, Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Or consider the Christmas carol that we love to sing, Away in a manger, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. He sounds so cute, doesn't he? We're left with a polite, meek, and mild Jesus. We like this side of Jesus because He seems so comfortable and so comforting. At the same time, we see the Jesus who stood up for the oppressed and who took on the cross. We see Jesus' wild and fully engaged side. And it can shake us up a bit. Here, Jesus is zealous that God not be dishonored. Here, Jesus is zealous for God's mission that includes all nations, not just the Jews. Praise be to God because that means the Gentiles get in too, which is many of us. Jesus says, stop turning my father's house into a market. When Matthew captures this memory, he adds in here that God's house is to be a house of prayer and they are making it a den of thieves. Jesus sees God's intentions being extorted, distorted and His mission being disrupted. And so He takes action. Jesus' action reminds the disciples in that moment of David in Psalm 69. Here's what we read. The words of David. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. David was willing to endure shame and insults and disrespect in God's name. David was zealous for God's house. Not because it was some four-wall structure, but because that house was where God's presence dwelt and God wanted all to be able to enjoy His presence. Jesus stated His mission in Luke 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. To seek and to save the lost. But how can Jesus do so when His Father's house is such a mess? If Jesus keeps pointing the way to His Father, but in the temple His people look like an inward-focused bunch of scam artists, then how will the lost ever be found? Even today, church, it is time for some zealous action. At times we can be very zealous but oftentimes we are zealous for the wrong things. Let's get zealous about what stands in the way of us showing Jesus to the lost and being people who again are on Jesus' mission. What stands in the way of us being Jesus' people who imitate Him by actively seeking those who are lost? 
Whatever answers we come up with, it is time to zealously clean our Father's house so that He might be seen by all who are seeking. The third idea in following Jesus in this way of freedom, verses 18-22. to The Jews then responded to Jesus, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The third idea is to act out Jesus' authority. The first question the Jews have for Jesus is, who gave you the authority to do this? They challenge Jesus' action in hopes of winning an argument and thereby bringing shame on Jesus. Jesus draws their attention back to the temple by talking about Himself as the temple. Jesus tells them if they destroy the temple, it will be rebuilt in three days. But they immediately think about this huge stone building that is surrounding them. The temple. The temple that was started by Herod. But then he died along the way. And his son continued construction. And that construction has been going on for 46 years, but it still is not finished. It was laughable that Jesus would claim to rebuild in three days what had taken teams of masons and contractors to build in 46 years. But Jesus showed that a change was coming. Relationship with God was no longer about a religious system that had a stone structure at the center. In His death and resurrection, the temple way would become obsolete. The true way to know God was present in Jesus Himself. Jesus has full authority as our risen King. We don't brag about this wood and stone structure that we come to meet in. Rather, we boast in Jesus Christ, our risen King, who gives us authority to live out life in His name. When it comes to removing barriers, we act in Jesus' authority. In the halls of the AU and the ECA. In the slum. In the financial district or in Bole. In business meetings, family gatherings, or informal coffee in the cafe. We are in those places as people on mission with Jesus' authority. In those places, we act out Jesus' authority, bringing justice, making oases in the deserts of the soul, leveling the ground and lifting up the oppressed. We have Jesus' agenda. We act out Jesus' authority so that the poor might hear good news, the blind might see, the captive might be freed, the loads of the oppressed might be lightened, and God's favor may be proclaimed to all. Now perhaps you've heard before that there are some ways that we typically judge success in a church or in a ministry. We could call these the three B's of Christian ministry. The one is butts in the seat. Or if you are in an NGO, that's beneficiaries. Second is budgets. How much money do we have? And third, buildings. How big? What kind of buildings do we have? But may we not get sidetracked by our buildings and our structures and our barriers. Rather, may we keep focused on the resurrected one. The one in whom we have full authority to act out His mission in our dark and dying worlds. The fourth idea on this way to freedom, verses 23 to 25. Now, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. 
He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. The last idea is to stay true to the cost of discipleship. When we clear the way to freedom, it will cost us. So we must stay focused. After Jesus cleansed the temple, we read about the signs and wonders that he did. We don't read what those signs and wonders were, but it sounds like it was an exciting time, which John, he paints very broadly for us here. But notice Jesus' response. Signs and wonders were happening, yet Jesus did not entrust himself to those people who were being set free. What does this mean? What I read here is that Jesus wanted to keep the cost of discipleship clear. Jesus' signs and wonders attracted many. It is easy to start to see Jesus as a miracle worker rather than seeing Jesus is as the counter-cultural king of all. Jesus' clearing of the temple shows him taking the hard road of being zealous for his father's business. His mission of seeking and saving the lost. But if too many started to see Him as merely a miracle worker, then they would miss the point of the fullness of what He had come to do. To change everything. And to turn the world upside down. Now, we know what is in each one of us. I know what is inside of me. I would take a miracle over suffering. I would choose comfort over risk. I would choose success over God's way of discipleship. And Jesus knows us even better than we know ourselves. The truth is that any time we start trying to cleanse the temples in our world in Jesus' name, there will be opposition. Anytime we start being zealous about justice and the lost, rather than simply seeking the religious status quo, we will make people uncomfortable. Anytime we start touching on comforts in the church in hopes of making the way clearer for outsiders, loud voices will start condemning. And when those voices of opposition start rising up, we very quickly want to back down. We choose comfort over walking out Jesus' authority. We choose false peace rather than working towards a costly true peace. We choose status quo over walking out Jesus' mission. His mission that can be very, very, very messy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, to deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only Him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, He leads the way. Keep close to Him. Denying myself to stay close to Jesus changes everything. It is the way to freedom. If Jesus showed up here today, What would He want to cleanse us of? What barriers and comforts have we taken on that cloud His mission? What rules and legalism have we embraced that Jesus would free us from? The beauty is that we don't have to wait for Jesus to walk in from the back with a whip in hand, flipping over chairs down the aisle. It would be quite a scene, wouldn't it? But instead, any of us who have responded to Jesus have the Holy Spirit inside of us right now. He is present. And He is speaking to get us back on mission. To counsel us and to teach us. This morning, ask Him, where are there barriers in yourself? What are the barriers, the obstructions you've put up in your life which are keeping others from being able to see Jesus? And secondly, ask Him, where are there barriers 
in our church to keep others from seeing Jesus clearly. May we offer these up to Him in repentance today, ready to walk out life freely with a barrier-free Jesus testimony. Let's stand and pray together. I'll invite the worship team to come back. Jesus, we thank You for this picture we get of You being so zealous and passionate about Your Father's business. And Jesus, we confess that at times we become so soft and so weak. We choose the way of comfort. We choose the way of easy peace. We don't want to make waves. We don't want to look like an, someone who's a crazy man. But we thank You, Jesus, that You showed us this incredible example of where You were zealous about Your Father's business. You were zealous about those who could not see Your Father clearly because of all the nonsense that had been put in the way. And so You passionately took action. Jesus, help us to do the same. Make us passionate about what You are passionate about. Jesus, we confess that oftentimes we do get zealous, but many times we're zealous about the wrong things. Many times we'll even put Your name on it. But it's really not Yours, it's ours. And so we choose to act out righteous anger in Your name, which is not even what You're being zealous about. We repent of those times when we take those things up. We take up the wrong things. Help us, Jesus. And Jesus, for the barriers that we have in our lives, the obstacles that we've put in place that, that differentiate us from them, Jesus, we confess that oftentimes those same barriers we put in place to keep others out also are keeping You out. They keep us from really, truly knowing You in deep, intimate ways. Jesus, break through this morning. Holy Spirit, we welcome You to stir in us today to bring up those barriers that we've put in place, the ways that we've resorted to legalism, the things we've put in place to very clearly mark us versus them. And Holy Spirit, we ask You that You would help us to sort through that this morning. We repent of those ways where we have taken You for granted. Those places where we have not given proper witness to who You truly are. Help us, Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Let's worship our Lord together.